uh, teams here. Over. Hi, everyone. I'll just introduce myself as well. Um, Giddy and I will be presenting jointly today. Um, my name is Diana Bartel, and thanks, um, Jenna, for the introduction already. And I am a senior food security analyst on FeesNet's early warning team focused on the horn. So, Gideon, over to you. Um, I'll move the slides. And um, uh, yeah, I think we're good to go. So, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks again, uh, Diana, for the introductions. Um, our presentation will be you know, 40 minutes presentation, then 15 minutes, of course, for further discussion. Our focus is mainly on the return of El Nino and its uh, potential implications for Eastern Africa. Next slide, please. So we've gone through the introductions. Uh, there are our two pictures. I have a limitation in terms of bandwidth, so you won't be able to see me uh, live on the screen. However, that's how I look like. And uh, of course, I've been working with FuseNet for a fairly long time uh, as a field scientist. Next slide, please. So in uh, getting into assessing the current conditions, forecast, and the most likely scenarios, I wish first to acknowledge with great thanks a lot of work that has been done by Sorry, uh, FISNET implementing you. You partners at uh, Santa Barbara, that's the Climate Hazards Group. Uh, oh, okay, so could be my uh, bandwidth, but again, are you able to hear me now? Um, yes, much better. Yes. Hello? Okay, so uh, apologies for that. Uh, as I was mentioning, as we go into assessing uh, the upcoming season in terms of uh, the main climate drivers that have big influence on our rainfall season for this year into next year. I wish first to acknowledge uh, with great thanks a lot of uh, teams that supported this work uh, at Santa Barbara, that's a climate hazards group. Then we have the NOAA team at our Climate Prediction Center and the Physical Lab. We also have a team within Eastern Africa, that's Chris and uh, Deriba supporting me. We have USGS, and then we have the NASA team. And more importantly, we've also reviewed what is uh, being provided as a consensus forecast among the national med services and also the IGAD Regional Climate Prediction Center. So it's uh, really a lot of uh, work that has gone into this, but uh, I'll get into details in a few. Next slide, please. So in terms of key messages, um, what we are saying is uh, at the moment, we are in a strong El Nino condition. And the climate forecasts are also indicating very high confidence that we will continue with these conditions into the end of this year and uh, weakening into next year. Provide details on that. The other part of the story is adjacent to us, the Indian Ocean. We are seeing positive Indian Ocean dipole, and I'll give details about this. This is the most significant and most influential uh, rainfall driver in our region. So it's positive and concurrently with the strong El Nino condition. So this typically means widespread above average rainfall amounts across most parts of Africa, Eastern Africa, sorry. In terms of the most likely scenario, there are two uh, issues I want to bring to the fore at the beginning. One is the beneficial impacts. So based on the focus that we have and also uh, average of uh, similar years we've seen in the recent past, with the above average rainfall, which is likely to be uh, 150% of average for most areas. In some areas that, with that, is, there's also associated risk in the, in the event we have very heavy rains coming across during this uh, uh, rainfall season. And also keep in mind, we are coming from historic five failed drought season. So again, it's a uh, flip from extreme drought conditions into well above average rainfall, which we are anticipating in coming months. 
So on the positive side, we anticipate that uh, we'll have uh, better agricultural production, both in terms of crop and livestock. And uh, this could facilitate ongoing gradual recovery in drought affected areas, especially the agro-pastoral and pastoral areas of Somalia, Eastern Ethiopia, and also Kenya and Northeastern Tanzania. However, heavy rains and flooding are also very likely in river and, and flood prone areas, which could drive human displacement, uh, crop losses and damage, and also an increase in pests and disease incidences across some of these areas. So I'll be providing details on some of that. So again, that could have an, Im an impact on our food security situation across our region, but details will be provided by Diana on this. Now, in the event that we have the worst case scenario, similar to some historic strong El Nino events and uh, positive IOD uh, events we saw in 1997 or 2019, then we anticipate we'll have extreme flooding and more severe and widespread negative impacts. So the whole presentation is intended to provide you with what is what are the beneficial impacts and where we are likely to see areas of major concern and we'll provide some hotspot areas to go with this. Next slide, please. So in terms of the state of global warming, we start by looking at uh, how the oceans, uh, the oceans, the global oceans are warming. So we are living in an unprecedented time, you know, looking at the dark uh, line, which is on top of all the other lines that you're seeing there. It's showing that we have, we are currently observing warmer than normal oceanic conditions, which are much higher than the average, which is the dotted line for the 30 year average, 82 to 2011 and also much warmer than last year. So on, on average, we are almost 1.5 degrees warmer than average and about 0 0.5 degrees warmer than last year. So in this, we are looking at a situation where we are saying these are unprecedented times and at the back of it is the emergency of uh, a global event that will have impacts in terms of uh, rainfall across our region. Next slide, please. So again, in, in looking at uh, the details for the oceanic basins that we looked at in general terms across very expansive areas, we start to see some depiction of which areas are warming relatively more than others. So area A is of major interest to us, that's over the Atlantic. This is the area we associate with ENSO event, and La Nina is what we are focusing on. So that area, you can see it in deep red colors, meaning it's much warmer than normal. So that is what we associate with El Nino conditions. And area B, which is adjacent to East African coastal area, we are also seeing expansive areas of warming across that area, which we are going to associate with Indian Ocean Dipole, but I'll get into details on that one. But again, if you look at North Atlantic and North Pacific areas, you also see extreme warming and also inland lakes. So some of this is what is really driving chaotic weather conditions across our region. Some examples are like Libya, where we saw the Mediterranean being warmer than normal and that uh, really resulted into episodic, very heavy rains across that particular area. Next slide. So in terms of uh, defining some of these terms that I'm using, El Nino, positive IOD, and its impacts in East Africa, I'd like us to just briefly uh, review what is El Nino and what is La Nina. So ENSO is El Nino um, Southern Oscillation e Event. And it's a, a three-phase type of event. We have warming, we have neutral, and we have cold. But we'll be focusing on the two significant uh, phases of ENSO events. One is El Nino, and that's where we are at. So in El Nino, we anticipate warmer 
than average sea surface temperature over the equatorial uh, tropical Pacific Ocean. So the picture, the depiction that is shown at the bottom uh, on your right shows how El Nino manifests itself across the Pacific, especially over the equatorial regions. The opposite is La Nina, where we have cooler than average sea surface temperatures over the tropical Pacific Ocean. Next slide, please. Again, it's important to know that we have El Nino and we have La Nina, but again, they show up with different characteristics. So I've given four different types of uh, El Nino to help us understand where we stand at the moment. Type one, where we are looking at mild El Nino. So if you look at equatorial Pacific, you see some bit of warming at the center there shown in orange color. Then we have moderate, which is slightly more expansive, but not very strong warming. Then we have type three, which is very strong warming at the center of equatorial Pacific. And then we have type four, which is strong to very strong, very strong El Nino conditions. Again, the reverse is true. So all these events have different implications in terms of uh, our regional climate in across the globe and also in East Africa. Next slide. In terms of uh, metrics, because we'll be talking of strong El Nino, uh, moderate El Nino conditions, I thought it would be also very useful for us to really categorize them. On the yellow to red color, that's the different classifications of El Nino. The weak one is plus 0 0.5 degrees to plus one degree. Moderate is a notch higher by 0 0.5. That's one degree to 1.5. Strong is 1.5 to 2 degrees, and then super El Nino is plus 2 degrees above average. So again, we are talking of strong El Nino, and you'll see very briefly that we have already crossed that threshold of plus 1.5 degrees Celsius. So that's why we are talking with a lot of confidence. We are already in strong El Nino phase. So on the other side of it, uh, I'll not spend a lot of time on that. It's the reverse that's cooler than normal conditions also being provided under similar categories. Next slide. Where do we stand at the moment? So currently the NOAA Climate Prediction Center is providing us with the assessment that uh, in the area where we monitor El Nino conditions, we are at plus 1.6 degrees Celsius. So again, that means we've crossed the line and we are in the strong El Nino category and it has persistently been warmer than normal for the past three months. If you look historically since 1982 to present, you can see some years popping out as on the red side. The red side is the El Nino where we have abnormally warm tropical uh, Pacific uh, oceanic conditions. And then on the blue is La Nina conditions. So we want to focus on the El Nino conditions and see where we stand at the moment. So we are getting close to what we saw in 1982. We are close to what we saw in 1997, what we also so in 2015. So at the end of that graph is where we stand, but the latest analysis is actually on the dotted line at 1.6. So again, that briefly gives you an indication of where we stand in terms of the strength of the current El Nino conditions. Next slide. Again, knowing El Nino, does not tell us what its influence is on global rainfall uh, patterns. So the map that you are seeing there is typical influence of El Nino across the globe in terms of rainfall patterns. So it means different things over different, I mean, different rainfall patterns across different geographical areas. For Eastern Africa, you can see a green, a light blue blob 
on the September, December, and that is indicative of enhanced rainfall in that general area. But just to the west and north of it, during June through September, the same El Nino has the opposite effect. It brings drier than normal conditions over Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan. To the south of us, that's Southern Africa, it largely or typically means drier than normal conditions. Similarly for Australia, the maritime continental areas, India, all these areas do have drier than normal conditions. And you can see the blue blobs running across also US on the southern side indicative of what it means in that area. So again, for Eastern Africa and parts of California, we share the same teleconnection with El Nino conditions. That means when we have very good rains in this region, that part of US also gets uh, favorable rains and sometimes extreme events. Next slide, please. Coming to the Indian Ocean Dipole, uh, this is one of the climate drivers or modes that are, is not well known across uh, the globe, but it has a lot of influence in terms of rainfall variability over Eastern Africa, especially during September through December into early the following year. This is based on differences in temperature between the West Indian Ocean, written there as WIO, and the Eastern Indian Ocean region. When we have warmer than normal conditions, very adjacent to our area, we tend to get more moisture and that fuels or results into enhanced rainfall in our region with winds coming from the ocean, really uh, fueling uh, the tropical rainfall system and providing more rainfall across Eastern Horn. The reverse is when we have cooler than normal temperatures on our coastal areas of Eastern Africa and the winds veer backwards into Asia, I mean the maritime continental regions. So it cuts off the moisture and we have drought in our region. So again, given that picture, it's very clear that uh, El Nino gives us more rains and positive IOD also ensures these areas, I, I mean, the Eastern Horn of Africa and much of our region gets lots of enhanced rainfall. So the synoptic picture of combination of both events occurring concurrently is shown in the next slide. So when we have positive IOD and El Nino, we typically expect very enhanced rainfall systems of Eastern Africa. So the flows there are showing how that rainfall system gets enhanced. The first bit is over the Indian, I mean the Pacific Ocean, the central regions, we have increased rainfall over central Pacific area where we have strong warming. And then a lot of that suppresses rainfall over the maritime continental regions. And then with the flow coming from the easterly flow coming from the east to the west also enhances rainfall across our region, that is Eastern Africa. So you can see clearly the uh, atmospheric circulation, how it's coupled with the Indian Ocean uh, conditions. So far, we are seeing that both the oceanic indicators and the atmospheric indicators are supportive of enhanced rainfall across Eastern Africa. Next slide, please. Given that uh, we have a good understanding of what the two climate drivers do in our region, it's very important to know that they come with different impacts. No two El Nino positive IOD areas, I mean uh, conditions, mean the same rainfall patterns across our region. So we have uh, taken some example of some strong El Nino and positive IOD conditions of Eastern Africa just to illustrate what has happened in the past and it will have a bearing to what we are likely to see in the upcoming season into next year. So in 1982, you see widespread above average rainfall being shown there in blue color. 
1994, it was much less in terms of uh, above average uh, rainfall. It was more confined to the eastern areas, while the western areas had below average rainfall. In 2006, it was also widespread rainfall and well above average. 2015 was relatively less, as we saw in 1994. But 1997, where we had a very strong El Nino, and uh, in 2019, when we had very strong positive IOD conditions, you can see clearly there was really very heavy rainfall that were three to four times of their seasonal averages, shown in pink color. So again, these are the years that we'll be looking at in terms of developing our scenarios for the upcoming season. Next slide, please. Again, going into understanding our vulnerabilities when we have an enhanced rainfall, we take two examples of uh, 1997 and 2019 of a rainfall station of our coastal region. We had daily information, daily observations in terms of uh, rainfall. And from October 1st to December, you can see two types of graphs. One is 1997 and the other one is 2019. The real story behind this is the fact that we get intense rains over short periods, like four inches or 100 millimeters over short periods. This is what we can't cope with. When you have very heavy rains over short time periods in, in uh, river valleys or very dry areas or even in urban areas, this causes a lot of flooding and destruction. And then this is recurrent over very short periods. Again, it means if we do end up with this type of a, uh, event, then we'll have very intense rains occurring over short periods of time in different areas. So again, that's something to keep in mind. When you look at monthly totals, the next slide, again, the story is almost the same. This is... Uh, rainfall observations from 1965 to 2022. I'm only looking at September, October, November, December, and have highlighted 1997 and also 2019. What I'm trying to show you here is uh, on a monthly time steps. There are times when we had the seasonal totals occurring in one month, like in 1997, in October, and also in 2019. But then, again, there are many years that had uh, variations of the same, but we'll be developing the most likely scenario based on some of the uh, almost similar years that we'll be picking from uh, statistical analysis. Next slide. Now, going into the climate focus, and I'll go th this, through this very quickly. One is uh, we are looking at the current global sea surface temperature anomalies. And again, the area of interest is the area uh, highlighted there as Nino 3.4 area. That is area that we monitor uh, changes in sea surface temperatures. So the graph on the side to the right of your screen is indicative of how steadily the temperatures have been rising since June. And we are now at plus 1.45 degrees Celsius based on the Bureau of Met Meteorology. The figures are always slightly different from what NOAA CPC provides because of varied baselines. But the baseline that we take into account is what is provided by the NOAA Climate Prediction Center, which is at plus 1.6. On the other side of it is over the Indian Ocean adjacent to us. We've seen that steadily rise from two weeks ago at plus 1.3, uh, 1.25 to 1.45. So again, we are on track in terms of saying we are seeing a developing scenario of concurrent strong El Nino conditions and also IOD conditions. Next slide. So again, if you look at the probabilities of whether we are likely to have the El Nino continuing into next year, you see at the moment in the bar uh, with uh, titled October through December, we have 100% that the El Nino will continue during this period. 
continuing into early January, February, decreasing. But as we get into the March, April, May season, which is our main rainfall season next year, there will still there's still that indication that this El Nino will continue into the March, April rainfall season with uh, about 22% of it uh, transitioning to and so neutral conditions. Next slide. Again, in terms of intensity, as I mentioned, we are in a strong El Nino condition in September. The outlook really shows that uh, strong El Nino conditions are expected to continue through January with over 70% uh, chance. The moderate chances at 24%, and for a weak event, there's really uh, no tangible uh, evidence that it will be there during this period. But as we get into next year, I think what is really important is that as much as we'll have El Nino conditions, its strength is likely to be very to be weakened, and the probabilities uh, for it being strong is very low at seven percent. We are likely to see more of a moderate to weak El Nino. In fact, more of a weak El Nino condition during uh, mid next year. Next slide. This looks at uh, really a long term outlook of what's likely to happen between now and next year. So again, from the red bars that are indicative of uh, <clears throat> forecast El Nino conditions, we are seeing they continue into next year. But again, as I mentioned, they continue to decline very significantly. And what takes over is with higher probabilities is the blue bars, which are indicative of La Nina conditions. So again, if you are talking about uh, late next year into 2025, we could be back again into La Nina conditions. But again, the probabilities are fairly uncertain and we need to continue uh, monitoring that. But in, in the event that does happen, then we are saying we are coming from very good rains, beneficial rains, but then we could have those extreme uh, episodic events within this season. But then next year, again, towards the end, we could be back to drought. Next slide. Uh, looking at the forecast uh, IOD or Indian Ocean Dipole, we are likely to continue seeing us. Teddy, we have very high probabilities of a strong El Nino conditions occurring, especially in October, November, and then weakening as we get into earlier next year. So situation where we are saying the upcoming season will have both concurrently happening and we have very strong confidence in that particular focus next slide in the event we do get the plus 1.6 positive iod conditions towards the end of this year then we are looking at it being comparable to the 2019 event which resulted into a lot of extreme events across Eastern Horn, especially Somalia. So again, that's a focus in the red bar. The orange just give you some history. The orange bars give you history of uh, past uh, positive IOD conditions and the blue are indicative of uh, negative IOD. So we are looking at a situation where we are almost getting to a comparable event to 2019 if that focus holds next slide in 2019 this is just to give you uh, an indication of how catastrophic that particular event was these are the adverse impacts that we saw in somalia where over 270,000 people were displaced over 10,000 hectares of cropped land was damaged and uh, over 250 animals were killed livestock and that is indicative of cattle there similarly for ethiopia we had really high numbers of displacement 
in Kenya, the situation was relatively less, but again, a lot of people were displaced in their thousands, similarly for South Sudan. So this is just to give you uh, a historical perspective of what happened during the positive IOD adverse impacts of Eastern Africa. Next slide. So having provided you with the current climate drivers and the focus, I want us to really review a few of the most likely rainfall and temperature outlooks that have been provided by uh, different agencies. And you'll see some strong consensus across all the focus that we've been looking at. So the IGAD Climate Prediction Center provides two focus. One is on rainfall for the season of October through December and also temperature. And in both of them show high probabilities of 65 to 85% for wetter and hotter than normal short rain season. So the colors there, the green colors there are indicative of the fact that the area bordering uh, northern Kenya, southern Somalia, and southeast Ethiopia, that's where we have very high probabilities for above average rainf rainfall. The green areas across the expansive eastern African region is indicative of above average rainfall with very high probabilities of about 65%. The temperature also is all in orange and uh, red colors indicative of hotter than normal conditions. So we are looking at a situation where we'll have wetter and hotter than normal conditions as recently provided by our regional uh, forecasting center. Next slide. This is just to show consensus, also with the World Meteorological Global Forecast, showing way above, I mean, above average, similarly for the temperature. So these are all in agreement with what we've just seen from the Climate Prediction Center. Next slide. So I'll move fairly quickly on this. Um, again, more consensus coming from the NOAA uh, team at the physical lab, also indicative of above average rainfall and there's very high uh, probabilities of exceeding the 80th percentile. That means we are on the highest uh, flooding, especially of uh, Eastern Kenya, Northern, Southern Somalia, and areas around that area. Next slide. Now coming to statistical focus, the Climate Hazard Center has been looking at uh, historical correlations of what happened in the last uh, 30, 40 years with what we are seeing now being focused. And what you're seeing there is observed September through December, uh, El Nino area of 3.4, the Z-scores, Z and what happened over, what was observed over the Indian Ocean, uh, corresponding uh, Indian Ocean Dipole uh, region. So 2023 is in the middle of that. So it's really closer to 1997, 1982, 2015, 2006, 2015, and uh, 2019. The regional climate forecast and also the national forecast are looking at 1997 and 2006 as being the closest to what we might be achieving. We have taken a broader look at all those years that we had strong El Nino and also strong IOD conditions. Next slide. Based on the identified analog years, we try to look at the quality of the season and uh, develop two scenarios, the most likely scenario and the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is the one we are saying 1997, where we had extreme uh, El Nino conditions. This would be the most adverse. But the most likely scenario is very indicative of uh, above average rainfall of uh, more than 150%. But again, over uh, areas of concern, that is Eastern Ethiopia, Southern Somalia, Central and Northeastern, those are areas where we had spread almost two times of what we normally get during that season. Next slide. In terms of the most likely scenario for agricultural conditions, we are move, moving on. We start looking at uh, the quality of the season in terms of the onset, the peak, 
distribution and cessation. So I have uh, three areas that I'll be looking at. One is the cropping areas of Juba area of Southern Somalia, where we look at the identified analog years against average. The average is the blue bars. The average of the analog years is in orange color and the dotted area, I mean the dotted curves are the extreme events of 1997. Again, looking at all that, we see that we are likely to see the onset in uh, early October to mid and then picking up in later part of October and then running into November. The end of the season based on those analog years is likely to be in December. Kitui is also um, an area in the southeast of Kenya showing almost similar trends, but then with a staggered start of the season as the rains shift southwards. But again, more rainfall in this area than what you'd see in the Somali Bay region. Next slide. This is uh, on the southeastern part of Ethiopia. That's uh, area three. Again, similar patterns. All I'm saying is with the information we get out of the analog years, we can talk of the quality of the season and how well distributed it is. So again, what I really want to highlight is the fact that we can provide some insights on when the season is likely to start, when is it likely to peak and have maybe incidences of flooding, and then when is it likely to cease. So in a geographical pictorial format, that's the next slide, we see which areas, next slide please, uh, Diana. We see very quickly when the rains are likely to occur based on these analog years. And again, whether they will be timely or late, the blue colors are indicative of whether, uh, I mean, they're indicative of timely to early onset on the Eastern side. But as you go to the West, you see a lot of orange colors, meaning there could be some delayed onset, especially around the Lake Victoria region, going into Rwanda, Burundi, and Southern Uganda. Next slide. Then uh, looking at uh, cropping conditions in terms of soil moisture, the root zone soil moisture conditions. Again, those maps are provided by our colleagues from NASA, the indicative of the amount of moisture and saturation levels. Green color is indicative of when are we likely to see the soils being saturated. And uh, again, October, November, December into January, see a lot of green colors over Eastern and Equatorial Eastern Africa, indicative of increased levels of moisture due to the enhanced rainfall that have been focused. The map to your left is really a collection of different uh, flood polygons through the period that we are looking at, 1981, 1997, 2006, 2015, and 2019. Those are the areas that were flooded. And then again, we are seeing uh, saturated soils in those particular areas. Next slide, uh, I'll move through this very quickly is an indication of favorable cropping conditions based on those analog years and areas where we are likely to see flooding. Again, very important, areas that are really cropped are very few across uh, Somalia region, but those same areas shown in green where we are likely to have good cropping conditions, there is an indication of flooding in the red colors. And then to over Kenya, again, you know, better yield conditions. If you compare with the ag stats, 2015, 2019, again, is a period where we had better production prospects. Uh, I'll go through this very quickly uh, because of time. Um, next slide. Again, in terms of uh, rangeland conditions, we borrow from those analog years. We are likely to see exceptional uh, vegetation conditions and rangeland resources. Next slide. Again, with all those rains, we anticipate that the cumulative uh, seasonal rainfall amounts will help fill in the surface water pans, which are already showing uh, drying conditions as uh, indicated in that map there. Next slide. Uh, we are concerned that uh, we could have desert locust inversion as we saw during the 2019-2020 period because of ex exceptionally good uh, vegetation conditions and also meteorological conditions with the locusts really flying in with those north northeasterly winds into our region. So areas that are hushed are areas that we are concerned could be hotspots for increased uh, desert locusts inversion. 
Next slide. Yeah, in terms of floods uh, risk scenarios, we have some detailed analysis. I'll not go through each one of them, but uh, very quickly highlight where we likely to see some hotspots and the numbers that are likely to be affected. So again, borrowing from those analog years, 1997, 2015, 2019, the, the purple colors show areas that are, were inundated over the Shabele, Juba River Basin and across uh, the coastal areas of uh, Somalia. Uh, again, the extent was varied across those years. The area inundated ranged from two, almost 3,000 square kilometers to 6,000 uh, square kilometers at the peak of 1997 floods. Next slide. Uh, again, where are the crops? Where is the population? Clearly, uh, uh, the maps are not very clear from here, but uh, again, a lot of these uh, riverine areas are where we have big population. Next slide. Uh, the peak of the flooding will most likely occur around October, November, as shown in those areas for Juba in orange colors for selected years. We didn't have data for 1997. So again, if you're looking at which period are we likely to see the flooding, then again, November, I mean, October, November is a period we need to really keep watch. Some of the southern areas had the flooding occurring in December. Next slide. Uh, similarly for Shabele, uh, same story, bank full in 19, uh, 2019. And uh, again, just to summarize the impacts on this, uh, taking a bit of time. Uh, next slide, please. These are the numbers that uh, we are looking at in terms of uh, different scenarios. If we went the 1997 levels, then the total area inundated could be 6,000 kilometers. Population at risk would be over 300,000. Cropland at risk would be about 180, 1,000 hectares. If we went 2015, then the numbers will be far less. So I'll leave those numbers on the screen for you to take a look. But again, if we do go with the extreme events, then we really anticipate a lot of people being displaced and also cropland uh, damages or at risk. Next slide. So I'll leave at this point, and uh, sorry for taking too much of your time, but again, Diana, uh, you can take it up from here. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Gideon. Um, so to frame our discussion of acute food insecurity implications, um, this is a very simplified seasonal calendar for East Africa with the region's major rainy season shown in blue. And while most of our focus right now is on the upcoming October to December short rain season, as Gideon has been presenting on, we'll start by just quickly looking at the concluding June to September Karemt rainy season in Ethiopia, where many areas have experienced atypically dry conditions linked to the El Nino. And so the map on the left is to provide a visual of the areas that receive these June to September seasonal rains in the Horn, including much of Ethiopia. And the map on the right is showing the likely picture of cumulative rainfall for the season expressed as a percent of the long-term average. And this takes um, the sum of observed per precipitation since the beginning of the season um, in, early, in the beginning of June, plus the forecast precipitation through the end of September. And so you can see that as the season concludes, many current receiving areas of Ethiopia are facing cumulative rainfall deficits expected to range from 10 to 40% or more of normal seasonal totals. And with parts of SNMPR, Aromia and Afar expected to be facing record low rainfall totals and or ongoing drought conditions. And this is due largely to the below average rainfall that has been received since July linked to the developing El Nino conditions. So in terms of impacts, uh, the current rainfall is important for both Meher crop producing areas of the country as well as pastoral areas of northern Ethiopia. And so the key takeaway is that poor current rainfall together with conflict and limited access to agricultural inputs are together expected to result in a below average Meher harvest in eastern Tigray, eastern Amhara, SNNPR, and along the Rift Valley in Aromia. And this is also likely to lead to negative impacts on pasture in northern pastoral areas with particular concern for afar. And so now shifting to focus on the October to December short rains or dare season, 
which of course is starting imminently. I'll try to be quick. Um, these maps just provide a visual of the areas that receive these October to December rains, um, looking at the areas where these rains are important for croplands on the left and where the rains are important for rangelands and livestock production on the right. And we'll first talk about expectations for acute food insecurity impacts related to crop production. And so these maps are familiar from Gideon's slides, but this is just to remind everyone of the most likely scenario for rainfall totals on the left and cropping conditions on the right based on the analog years we're using to model the most likely scenario. And building from what Gideon has already shared, the main takeaway for acute food insecurity impacts is that we do expect above average rainfall in the October to December season to have overall positive impacts on crop production and therefore on access to income from agricultural labor during the season and around January um, on food and income from crop production and sales once the harvest is ongoing. However, heavy rainfall and flooding is expected to cause some damage to standing crops as well as to food stocks from the prior long rain season with riverine and low lying areas likely to be those that experience the negative impacts. Uh, on the other hand, in riverine areas, despite disruptions to typical main season agricultural activities in this upcoming season, and ultimately reduced expectations for main season crop production as a result of the flooding and flooding related disruptions. Once the flood waters do recede, um, this will bring about improved opportunities for recessional cultivation. And as Gideon mentioned, it's also worth noting that the rainfall forecast is linked to an elevated risk of crop pests, including desert locusts due to anticipated favorable breeding conditions, which could reduce crop production prospects in affected areas like what we saw in 2019. So in terms of expectations for pasture and livestock production, the key takeaway here is also one of overall positive anticipated impacts with livestock births and productivity during the upcoming season expected to increase herd sizes and milk production, supporting ongoing gradual drought recovery in affected areas of the horn. And so the map on the left shows pasture conditions as represented by satellite measured vegetation greenness. And this is showing conditions as of late September expressed as a percentage of the historical average. And you can see here that currently um, pasture conditions are generally below average in much of the horn linked to an atypically hot and dry, dry season in uh, past recent months. And this is also a time of seasonally low pasture availability. And the chart on the right is showing typical season trends in pasture availability in, in one central region of Somalia. And the box is showing the period of notable improvement that typically occurs during the upcoming October to December rainy season. And so this trend of improvement is expected to be enhanced by the above average rainfall forecast. So while we expect that heavy rainfall will lead to short term inundation in affected rangeland areas, the overall impacts will be positive, widespread seasonal regeneration of pasture and water resources. Um, the regeneration of water resources will also likely have positive impacts on water prices. And however, heavy rainfall and flooding will come with elevated risk of livestock and human disease incidents. And now these are FuseNet's projected acute food insecurity outcomes for the region for the October to January period. And I wanna note that these are projections made as of July, August. Overall, the mapped outcomes do generally reflect expectations for a seasonal improvement in this period due to improvements in crop and livestock production during the October to December season. However, severe acute food insecurity outcomes in line with crisis and emergency are anticipated to persist in much of the horn. And this is in large part due to the lasting impacts of the historic five season drought, including severe asset depletion, including of livestock assets and high levels of accumulated debt. I would also note that the pause in US government assistance in Ethiopia is expected to be is expected to continue to contribute to severe outcomes in this period. But in terms of how El Nino specifically is factored into our analysis of outcomes, the key takeaways we want to leave you with are as follows. Um, first, we do expect that many Karem's receiving areas of Ethiopia will experience below average Meher crop production 
um, due to the below average rainfall as well as impacts of conflict in some areas. And this will reduce households typical available food and income in the October to January period. Um, though greater concern exists when households exhaust food stocks from the harvest around January and beyond. And looking to the October to December season, the key point is that above average rainfall um, will bring mainly positive impacts due to support for crop and livestock production. However, there are negative impacts on acute food insecurity anticipated in areas that are affected by heavy rainfall and flooding, particularly riverine and low-lying areas. And these negative impacts include human displacement, damage to infrastructure, property and crops, livestock diseases and deaths, access constraints, et cetera. And as riverine areas of Somalia are among those of highest concern due to the high likelihood of flooding, I wanna note as we look at this map of outcomes that given the evolving forecasts uh, and information made available in the recent IPC, FUSENET is currently working to assess whether emergency outcomes are most likely in riverine areas in this period. Finally, there is a credible alternative scenario where even heavier extreme rainfall leads to more widespread severe flooding as um, Gideon showed in the selected analog years. And this would likely lead to worse food security outcomes than what you see mapped. Now, knowing that we only have five minutes left, um, I intended to present some further information on what a worst case scenario might look like in terms of the food security impacts. Um, and this is a look at what happened in 1997 um, based on FuseNet's analysis at the end of that year. Um, I think in the interest of time, I will pause here because the information is available on the slides. Um, but I just wanna note that um, some of the most severe impacts occurred in um, not just riverine areas of Somalia, but also the uh, high sorghum producing areas in between the Juba and Shabele rivers in terms of um, uh, damage to crops in those areas. Um, and in Ethiopia, uh, as well as in Somalia, in pastoral areas, uh, there were notable negative impacts, including livestock deaths. Whereas in Kenya, impacts were generally assessed to be positive, though coastal and riverine areas experienced um, some damage, including to long, stand, to long season um, crops that were still standing. And I do wanna also note that um, the humanitarian response was significantly impacted by access constraints in the aftermath of these flooding, um, mostly due to the persistent high waters and damaged roads. So this is, while not the most likely scenario, something to very much be keeping in mind as a credible alternative scenario. Um, this is my last slide. This is just uh, looking at FuseNet's analysis of packed and projected food, past and projected food assistance needs. Um, you can see the trajectory of seasonal improvement during the October to December season. However, in a worse um, case scenario than what is currently anticipated, the decline in needs would be less than what you see here. Um, we do anticipate needs would still decline, but in the localized affected areas, needs would, of course, increase um, due to the negative impacts. So I will stop there and uh, apologies for not leaving very much time for questions, but um, I have time to stay on for questions, um, should there be any. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, Gideon, for a great presentation, a lot of wonderful information. I am going to stop the recording and then hopefully we'll have time to field one or two questions. <laughs>